That's all I needed to know. I, I got to look into it. it. Our name is in it. Non-fungible. Name's in it. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha! Been waiting to drop that one. Crypto. Everybody's talked about it in the past year. Cryptocurrency. Cryptocurrency. What is the strategy as far as the crypto space? The market shot up and people were happy. Then it pulled back. Now people are worried. Bitcoin dropping more than 3% today. I'm looking at the significant fall in the cryptocurrency. Elon Musk tweeting earlier this hour, you cannot buy Tesla with Bitcoin anymore. So what can we learn from sitting down with one of the low-key cryptocurrency insiders in America? Is he a billionaire? Can he help make me a millionaire? Why is everything in crypto inspired? by Japanese culture. Eric is the young CEO of Injective Protocol, whose token has a market cap of over $400 million. We'll talk to him and some big EDM DJs that are using NFTs for their business. By the way, this is not financial advice. What's going on guys? Welcome to Upside Mindset. This is our very first episode. I feel very cool today uh, because we are here with Eric. Hey guys, how's it going? I'm gonna go ahead, Eric, and say you're like 10 out of 10. You're one of the biggest crypto insiders in the continental United States. I mean, I wouldn't wanna say biggest, but right. you know, like, like, like definitely, you know, or work on my own projects, definitely been in the space for a very long time. Hi, I'm Eric. And we are Injective Protocol, the best and most secure experience for decentralized exchange. So Injective Protocol is the first fully decentralized exchange protocol that lets uh, anyone to share liquidity and fully prevents front running from occurring. You're not just like having been just commentating on the space. You are in this space. You are a NBA player and have been an NBA coach versus just a NBA fan. Tens of thousands of people are heading to Miami this weekend for what's being called the largest cryptocurrency conference in history. I mean, is this proof of how much Bitcoin yeah. has taken off in the last year or what? Organizers say they've sold out of tickets. How does somebody go from zero out of 10 to 10 out of 10? So first of all, you know, I study like uh, finance and CS in school and then a lot of, you know, a lot of background knowledge. It's a very interesting overlap for, uh, uh, for crypto. In 2017 or 2018, uh, basically started like going through a lot of research. And back then, you know, a professor in my school also was uh, doing a lot of contributions to a lot of, you know, like the back then, the more high, uh, higher profile projects out there. Later on, worked in a few funds, uh, you know, specifically on uh, like uh, fund day of trading and stuff like that, because there was just so much opportunity there. Um, and yeah, like that's when, you know, slowly over time, over the course of one to two years, you just get more and more familiarized uh, with the crypto space. So you got into the crypto space early. Yeah, so well, relatively right, speaking. Right, it's yeah. almost like, just for people on our channel to understand, it's almost like you were working at Supreme with James Jebbia, like before Supreme turned into this huge hype thing. This was at a time when crypto was already booming, but more for people who knew about it. Now it's like mainstream. So this is not the first time that crypto has kind of like gone up and down, correct? Yeah, um, I remember 17, it was like still like a very, very small space, uh, but 18 definitely like it just exploded exponentially. What convinced you through the boom and the bust and now we're in a boom again to diamond hands, your, your, your belief in it and your all the work you had put in, because I'm imagining some of your coworkers are like, I'm out. Once you've uh, realized that you have a certain level of understanding, that's, you know, either top 10% or like top 5% within the space, then you realize that, you know, like this is probably the space for you to be in. Technical people are kind of like uh, very, very hard to find. And, you know, those who can marry, uh, you know, finance and uh, especially software engineering background uh, is even harder to find. Your company, Injective Protocol, sounds really cool just by name, but uh, can you explain what it is? Yeah, so um, Injective Protocol is a fully decentralized derivatives exchange protocol that allows anyone to create futures markets, perpetual swap markets, and uh, create this entire exchange ecosystem where people can trade uh, and interact with each other. Okay, okay. Is there another way we can word it for people who have no idea what you're talking about? Yeah, so basically um, people can create, you know, futures contracts, um, you know, like trading the futures of, you know, stocks, futures of a coin, futures of commodities, um, just by, you know, a uh, click of a button within five minutes, and then, you know, they can create that market for everyone to trade on. Now that we've established, Eric, uh, what you guys do at Injective Protocol, it's a very successful company. It's gonna, it's got, you know, predictions to become even more successful as this space grows. What has just been happening the last few months with crypto? It feels not like 2018, but like almost some shade of that again to a, to a layman. So I think generally there's a lot of institutional demand uh, starting from the end of 2020 and all the way leading up to you know, this entire uh, 2020. You're talking about for Bitcoin or for crypto? Just the entire crypto. And by institutions, you're talking about banks, 
these big yep. uh, traditional institutions, right? So, so you know, like there's side, you know, legitimacy around it. Uh, you know, Morgan Stanley started acquiring uh, uh, positions. You know, uh, MicroStrategy was kind of one of the first few public companies to do it. Um, and you know, it really started peaking up its interest. It kind of like set it as an example that you know this is a legit industry. Um, it, 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 it's safe enough to invest and for people to come in. And I think that's really what contributed this uh, whole you know, excitement around crypto and you know like uh, everything that trickles down to it. Right, because the institutional adoption leads to uh, mainstream media adoption. Mainstream media adoption leads to mainstream retail investor adoption. Yeah. So it's this whole domino effect, right? And that and that's a what? Uh, just pump uh, an incredible amount of money into the space, right? Yeah. So basically, the reason why your mom and dad are texting you about crypto right now is because the institutions got it. Real quick, just to answer this question, should people be scared right now? Obviously, Bitcoin hit a high of 65. Now it's in the 40s right now, low 40s as of right now. Is it at support? Is it at whatever? Real quick. Do you have an opinion on that? Can you make a comment? So, so I would say like generally, you know, it depends on, you know, for all the, the, the broader user, like what your time horizon is. If your time horizon is 10 years or like, you know, 20 years or you're saving for retirement, um, I think the greater crypto space, you should look at it from, you know, from 10 years ago, for example. So um, really, do you really care about, you know, all the movements within the next two months or three months? Um, or should you care about, you know, where is it going to be like five years or 10 years from now? So you're saying, no, don't be really scared if you can just hold on to it. Yeah, um, because, you know, like there's always going to be speculators in the space and we've seen, you know, in equity market and traditional market, that's always going to be the case. Uh, it's just about the mobilization of these retail base. So um, at the end of the day, it's all about, you know, like um, th these are one of those things where, you know, you can't be always right. But, you know, once you're right, you're uh, you're set. Switching gears a little bit to something that uh, is more our space, the culture space. Why does it seem like a lot of things in crypto have like some sort of Japanese theme to it? Like crypto really started uh, with a lot of um, connection to you know uh, Japan in general. Right, the first ever Bitcoin exchange was uh, Mt. Gox, which is based in uh, uh, Japan. Uh, most of the exchange today, um, their matching engine and their uh, central server is still based in you know Tokyo. Um, and just in general, uh, there's a lot of you know Japanese native uh, cryptocurrency communities. For example, NEM uh, is a very very popular cryptocurrency that really sets its ground. Um, uh, within the Japanese community. Japan is very much of a um, modern, urban, like almost like cyberpunk as country. And I think that's kind of like where crypto really looks uh, looks forward to being, right? Uh, digitized value, digitized uh, art, digitized identity. Um, everything is, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer transparent, um, and not controlled by, you know, someone central. I know that everybody's into crypto across the world. I know, especially in Europe and stuff. But does it seem like there's a, there's a lot of Asian people into crypto? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think uh, crypto is one of the, I would say, few industries that's very, very much global. So, you know, it doesn't really have like a, a locus that's, you know, uh, uh, singled around, you know, a few nations. For average people out there, uh, and I think we went pretty deep cut already, what should they be doing? What would you want them to understand yeah, what would about you want the them space? To because most people are probably like, Dude, yeah. is ETH, I, I bought ETH at 3,700, it's at 34, I'm down, dude. I, I am sure based off the title of this video, people are looking to you to tell them what to buy. You know, beyond just uh, buying coins, you know, like holding them, I think just in general, like um, there's a lot more opportunities, especially with the advance of DeFi, um, to really treat it as something that's uh, stable, as something that's safe as an investment. For example, you know, you can earn 10% uh, on your, your USDC or USDT, which is basically dollar back um, uh, on, you know, Compound or Aave. Uh, and these are, you know, like lending protocols that, you know, will never uh, rug pull or like, dump on you. At the base level, if you want to be safe, you can kind of like, instead of buying what you, people used to do is like buy American bonds, right? For safety, they can buy into the USDC mm -hmm. coins. Can you explain real quick how a token pumps? It depends on, you know, how much is being floated in the market. So first of all, you know, there could be tokens that pumps, uh, you know, 100% or 200%, but you know, you have to start, you have to look at, you know, what's the starting market cap or like basically more importantly, what's the starting float. How many coins there are. Yeah, how many and, coins there uh, are. Just like uh, in a stock, how many potential shares there are, right? That will determine the market cap. Yep. If someone really wants to buy a coin and they kind of just buy it indiscriminately, um, they will push your price way up because you would, you know, uh, uh, as a market maker, or, you know, as you know, uh, a trader, you wouldn't be selling all of your coin at you know one price point. You would be like spreading it out. So that's how kind of like a lot of coins with global liquidity 
uh, kind of goes up so quickly and then you know goes all the way back down because you know like people might just want it all of a sudden and then you know people saw the price action and they you know they want to liquidate their position and so that's why you know during low liquidity events and we kind of saw that for GME as well um, you know you just see the price going up and down up and down like 30 percent uh, every other second um, it's just you know like the phenomenon of like low liquidity you are sort of explaining why in crypto sometimes um, cryptos go up 50 percent and then they go down 50 percent and everybody just it's normal yeah um but obviously this is like for like the mature coins but that's what people usually hear about is like hey my coin went up you know uh, uh 10x my, uh, my coin went up about 100x uh but uh you know generally uh, you would see that you know most of these you know like more mainstream you know like uh more uh, i would say uh, widely uh heard of or, like the accepted coins um generally you know they're not as volatile compared to you know like all the one overnight 10x coins is anything like Doge pumping a pointless coin, can that ruin the crypto space? I think some people were like, ah, oh, Doge is making the crypto space look bad, it's looking illegitimate, it's giving crypto a bad name. Generally, it's like good to see like so many people are being mobilized. So like, like, for a lot of people, it's the first time they're learning about crypto. Right. Uh, it might not be the best, but generally I would say, you know, like uh, the more people learning about crypto, the more people learning okay. about blockchain. So it's, it's good because it ultimately got people into the space and got people thinking about crypto. Yeah. And the more people think about crypto, maybe the more people will trust it. Yeah. Is Elon Musk good or bad for crypto? He's kind of like that catalyst in the space where it could go both ways. Like he, he introduces volatility basically. At the end of the day, if, it's, if, it, was, if it wasn't Elon Musk, it would be someone else. It could have been Kanye. Yeah. It could have been Biden, Trump, whoever. <laughs> yeah. So now that we got the audience kind of caught up, we asked all the normie questions. Tell us about this NFT stuff. Is it just buying LeBron gifts? What is it? There's a new craze breaking out in the crypto world and it's all about crypto collectibles, non-fungible tokens or NFT. In February alone, NFT sales hitting $340 million over the last few weeks. You may have heard people talking about NFTs, which I found out too late does not stand for nudist fishing trip. Like NFT, you can like understand it as a like more liquid, more easily tradable, collectible, and you can understand it as like a baseball card that's always going to be mint condition. You don't have to worry about like it getting scratched, scratch. You don't have to like worry about storage costs and stuff like that. How is it different than a crypto token? Because probably that is immediately kind of confusing, right? Because it's built off the blockchain, but it's not a coin. Generally, for coins, it's like highly fungible. Like you can go down to you know, 0.001, 0 .00, 0 .00, like 18 decimal. Level. But for NFT, like you can make it like one to one, or you can make it, you know, just uh, 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 just non fungible at all. Like basically, you know, there's only five ever existing. You can't really break it apart. The design philosophy behind it is like you know, this is uh, this is one to one. Like you can't have half of the NFT. Exactly. I either have the whole thing or I don't have it at all. Exactly. Who is buying these NFTs? You know, because like. I hear a lot of these like people saying NFTs is the future, but then the same people who say NFTs are the future are the same people who say I think 90% of NFTs in five years will be worthless. This is the same same case for like any collectible. Let's say you collect some some kind of vintage. Um, you know, if you're trying to sell it, you might not you know find like, a buyer anytime soon. Like maybe like you put it on the market for three years, it'll take three years to find a buyer, right? Because this is at the end of the day, it's fun, right? Um, it's, you don't need a thousand uh, a thousand or a million fans to one true fan. And I heard a lot of uh, NFTs, um, it's not just for collectibles, it's also being used for like restaurants and it's going to have all these other uses. Uh, can you shed some light on those? NFT itself is basically a term where you know, the token is not fungible, right? So uh, it, it has very, very broad applications, right? Like, um, you know, restaurants can give you like a token or, I don't know, like tables and stuff like that. These are, you know, like more like uh, kind of like uh, applications of NFT rather than, you know, like what we mainly understand in NFT. You're saying people shouldn't consider them as serious investments, right? Generally, these digital collectibles, um, uh, I, I would not you know, consider them as investments. What about like wills? You know how like families are always fighting over like the wills of like a wealthy grandfather. Could he NFTIs his assets and the second he dies, it just boop, and then everybody just gets their fair share. That is certainly one of the use cases. Once, you know, like there's enough infrastructure around it to build, like, you know, people linking NFT to physical goods. Uh, you know, people, a lot of people are like, trying to sell uh, bank seats. Um, along with an NFT to like prove this authenticity, right? Like generally, once those infrastructure is fully built out, like you know, there could be this entire smart contract self-sovereign system where you know you don't even need lawyers to be involved. How can smart contracts help the world? Like, let's say New York City, like solve some of New York City's problems. Yeah, the only thing I'm familiar with is smart contracts is Cardano in Africa, 
where like maybe certain places had a hard time verifying um, like college degrees. So now like Cardano is helping them say like, no, you really, this guy person legitimately has a college degree from this place. The most basic and most understandable use case would be like digital uh, identification or digital certificate. You know, that could be extended to everywhere, you know, like a, a college degree or, you know, uh, you know certificate of uh, authenticity and stuff like that. So I think money globally is actually very, very, very expensive and difficult and uh, you know, error prone process. Crypto kind of like uh, makes it so much easier to like transfer value across uh, uh, the world. With smart contract, you can actually ascribe and you know uh, program these values to be enforceable and executable without the presence of a lawyer or the protection of law. So very bullish on NFTs. Yeah. Okay. Well, shoot. That's what I'm. I, that's all I need to know. I, I gotta look into I'll it. it. Our name is in it. Non fungible. Name's in it. Ha <laughs> ha. Been waiting to drop that one. All right, that was an amazing talk with Eric, and I think we got to dive really, really deep, but we have so much more to talk about, and we have a special guest we're gonna be introducing. He's actually anonymous, and he's actually known for burning the one of one Banksy and turning it into an NFT. So, on to the next spot. All right, on our way to our second spot, we're actually gonna stop by Test Life, which is a Japanese store, and we're gonna go pick out some snacks, but we wanna introduce your friend here, Burn Banksy. Yeah. What's going on, guys? You have somewhat of a self-explanatory name. Yeah, yeah, burned Banksy. Uh, we burned a Banksy, actually. <laughs> it's kind a of Banksy, a Banksy <laughs> art piece, <laughs> one of one. Why did you do that? Yeah, so essentially, you know, a lot of the flack that I was getting from a lot of the people who weren't in the NFT space, in the crypto space, was along the lines of, well, if it's not in my living room and I can't touch it and I can't show people it, well, where's the value in that? So I said, fine, let me take something that sold at a Sotheby's auction, was from a famous artist and has value, because it was on a wall, I photographed it, digitalized it, turned it into an NFT, and then burned the original. So only the NFT is left in existence forever. A group of crypto enthusiasts recently purchased a piece of artwork by the mysterious street artist Banksy, and then they burned it. The blockchain company called Injective Protocol bought the screen print Morons for nearly $100,000 from a New York art gallery. You were trying to make a point about NFTs. Exactly. And you re did you resell the piece? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we, we ended up selling the piece for 100000 and then we resold it for what was $400,000 at the time. Wow. Okay, okay. All right, you guys, we had to continue our cyberpunk food crawl. You know, obviously we came from the izakaya. We also have Japanese crepes in front of us, one savory, one sweet, a collection of Japanese snacks. We're with Burnt Banksy, of course, Eric Chen. Could you give me a couple different pieces of, maybe not advice, but where to look at if I want to get into crypto at different levels? Because I think certain people are watching this, they're at level one out of zero. They just want to know, hey, should I still use Coinbase? you know or how do i make an nft to you know where they should be looking if they want to get into like stuff like what you guys are doing i think like the first thing that i gotta say is like don't do anything just for the primary like reason to get rich off of it right like do it because you enjoy it and you, you think there's something wrong that you can fix otherwise i promise you you're not going to go far with that uh, a really good place to start uh i gotta give you a pretty good recommendation uh somebody called open sea has something called the open sea bible and it really is an nft bible and i couldn't recommend it more for a good, informative read. Everything from you know buying to selling to minting to the back end, very knowledgeable, uh, open sea Bible. For example, like the most basic case is like getting some stable coins or getting Ethereum. I think that's you know how you interact with the greater decentralized finance space. Um, and then from that point on, you know interacting with some of the basic, very very low risk lending protocols. And obviously, you know, there's there's still a lot of security risk to it, so definitely don't, you know, um, put your uh, uh, put all of your savings into it. Um, and you know, like like start lending out your money. Like um, you you start you know seeing some of the APYs. You you start you know seeing that it's really beating out a lot of you know the main street uh, investment portfolios. From that point on, you know, like uh, experiment with different you know new DeFi protocols. There's so so many interesting strategies that you can employ. Um, for example, you know, like uh, providing liquidity on Uniswap. Do, do you recommend people getting into it in the way that they that they understand? Let's say, for example, they're huge NBA fans. They're getting into NBA hot shots. You know what I mean? They're into this side. They're getting into that side. Maybe I'm in the streetwear, streetwear art. I'm on these on the on Banksy cause. I mean, I think start off where you're interested, right? Like, if you're interested in art, you know, 
probably not really knowledge, you know, maybe you don't want to trade derivatives on, uh, you know, Ethereum or something like that. But if you're in the NBA, I mean, I love NBA Top Shots because of how many people got into the industry for NBA. I and mean, there really is a big crossover between, you know, NBA players and people who enjoy crypto. Get into it on the level that you're, that you're into it. If you don't love it, don't do it. Everybody knows that this space um, can be very also like, obviously, not only game changing, but financially lucrative. Do you have any like larger goals that you like want to push? Yeah, I mean like um, obviously you know, I want Injective to grow uh, and reach its true vision. And you know another really strong focus I want to work on is you know funding a lot of Asian initiatives, uh, especially the entertainment space, um, and just you know like how changing the perception of Asians within you know the North America. I think there's a current way of thinking that you know especially of trust coming from the top up and. You know, I really think there should be more power to the people and the people who are working on the ground floor. And I think I'd like, you know, more of a mental revolution kind of when it comes to that and seeing a lot of people who, you know, are working for someone else to become rich and all of these off. All right, big shout out to Eric and Burnt Banksy right here. Thank you for sticking with us and really trying to break down the game at different levels. What we're going to be doing now is we're actually going to be having a conversation with some of the top EDM DJs in the world, bass jackers, about their NFT project and what they're doing right now. Because, hey, they, everybody looks up to EDM DJs now, so if they're doing it, I don't know. Might want to think about it. Yo, what's going on, Marlon? What's up, guys? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Oh, good. For the people watching, could you quickly introduce yourself, like where you guys are from, who you are? So I am uh, Marlon. I am the DJ half of the DJ producer duo Bass Checkers. We are from the Netherlands. Um, we were living in Amsterdam, but since January of this year, we're based in Taiwan. Tell me about what you guys are doing in the NFT space and like how you guys got started in that. I've kind of always been into crypto, like at least for a few years now. I think I uh, bought uh, my first Bitcoin in 2016. Uh, you know, I went through the whole market all the way up, all the way down and always kept my, on, my eye on the space. I never lost interest. And at some point I saw NFTs. Didn't really know what it was yet. I saw crypto punks, crypto kitties. It was more a form of uh, digital collectibles. And I thought it was cool, but I didn't really see anything like it didn't spark anything for me to get get involved with it until I saw last year, November, um, DJ Blau dropping his NFT on Nifty Gateway. And that's when I suddenly like I saw like we have to do something with this because we can now like produce music, uh, combine it with cool visuals and release it as an NFT. And it's a cool way to like connect with your fans. I know some other, I've heard some other uh, like DJs got into the space. Uh, it seems early, like, is there a sense that like EDM DJs like kind of got into uh, either crypto or uh, NFTs a little bit earlier than maybe certain other genres? First of all, you travel a lot. You meet a lot of different people, a lot of different cultures. I think that generally makes you more open-minded about uh, stuff. Second, I mean, we are one of the biggest geeks that I know. Like, you know, like we <laughs> produce music on a computer. Uh, we do everything on our computer. We're basically at least 12 hours a day behind our screens. Um, that's just, that, you, you need to be a little bit of a, a computer geek to succeed in, in EDM. There's a lot of overlap between producing EDM, being generally interested in new technologies, gaming, all of that. Um, I think that's just what it is. Combine that with a little bit open mind for new stuff. And that's how you roll into NFTs pretty fast. Word. All right. Uh, last question, man. What were some of your favorite things that you've been eating out in Taiwan? Taiwan. People love the food, they love the night market food, they love the street food, they have good Japanese food uh, out there. I really like Din Tai Fung and the Xiaolong Bao. I can't read any Chinese or anything, so I just point at something random and I, I get it and I just eat it. <laughs> it's usually pretty good. All right, cool, Marlon. Thanks, man. Uh, good chatting and thanks for shedding some light on the NFT space and how, you know, a lot of like the EDM DJs are, are, are using it and how it's just, 
you know, making its way into the music industry. So I appreciate that. Thanks for having us. All right, yo, peace. To be transparent, we do have some crypto investments. So sitting here and talking to these guys really helped me understand the space better because like anyone, I wanna make money. But I also know that if you actually understand and believe in blockchain technology, then you won't be as worried when it dips. So for now, it's still considered a speculative space and you can lose a lot of money. But that's why educating yourself on the topic is super, super important. Hopefully you found this video useful and let me know in the comments below what you think about cryptocurrencies. Maybe you hold some. Let us know. And also let me know if you like this style of video. We want to meet with more successful people in the finance and crypto space so that, you know, along with us, you can also learn something. So until next time, we out. Peace.